Today I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. Tomorrow I've got a, a longer introduction scheduled to the, to the conference. And today I just really wanted to um, say that when I first thought about putting this um, conference in a non-human term together, the first two people that came to mind to invite and to sort of begin building uh, the plenary sessions around were uh, Brian Masumi and Aaron Manning. Uh, their work's been important to me for uh, the last decade and more, and I wanted to have a chance to bring them out to uh, Milwaukee, but also because of their collaborations with uh, Nathaniel Stern and Nicole Ridgway uh, in uh, artistic matters. And I wanted to continue to have an opportunity to build on those collaborations as well. So um, Brian and Aaron will uh, kick off the conference this afternoon. Afterwards, uh, we've got a reception over at Sala. You're all invited to come uh, and join us there. And um, yeah, I look forward to hearing the talk. So let me first uh, ask uh, Rebecca Sheldon to come up and uh, introduce Brian Sumi. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce Brian Masumi as the first plenary speaker in the Center for 21st Century Studies 2012 Non-Human Turn Conference. Brian Masumi is Professor of Communication Sciences at the University of Montreal in Quebec, Canada. He is the author of four scholarly monographs, including A User's Guide to Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deviations from Deleuze and Guattari in 1992, Parables for the Virtual Movement, Affect, Sensation in 2002, and most recently, Semblance and Event, Actives, Philosophy, and the Current Arts. In addition, he has published scores of articles and interviews, a half dozen or so of which produced together an important reading of the temporality of preemption under the Bush administration's war on terror. His work as a translator, especially his celebrated translation of Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, dovetails with his generous and generative readings of philosophers as diverse as Alfred North Whitehead, Suzanne Longer, Baruch Spinoza, and William James. Add to that his editorial stewardship with Michael Hart on Minnesota's Theory Out of Bounds series and with Aaron Manning on MIT's Technologies of Lived Abstraction, and it becomes clear how substantially he has contributed to what we mean when we talk about contemporary theory. Yet despite this broad influence and the range of thinkers he engages, Brian's work remains strikingly original. In his sustained account of transversality of movements across milieus, Brian shows us the, the dynamism that tends the apparent solidity, discretion, and precomposition of the world. Those concepts most highly associated with his work, virtuality, sensation, affect, movement, force, and mediation, all enter at different angles into the event of the transversal to show us how the passage of force shifts everything as it moves and moves because everything shifts. These are not just ontological claims. They are also methodological and compositional incitements. Throughout his work, Brian sidesteps truth-telling to ask instead what a concept makes and what we might make with a concept. In the Translators Forward to a Thousand Plateaus, Brian invites us to, quote, lift a dynamism out of the book and incarnate it in a foreign medium, whether it be a painting or politics, unquote. In his work with Aaron Manning in the Sense Lab, he has done exactly that modeling scholarly practice beyond the monograph, uh, and reminding us that concepts we draw from our objects of study might be as productively engaged through transductive practices of amplification, echo, refraction, and foretracing as through explanation, exegesis, and argumentation. His contribution today, animality and abstraction, promises another set of concepts through which to think the open-ended becoming of the world. Please join me in welcoming Brian Musumi. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And I wanted to, to thank uh, Richard for, for bringing me here for the uh, invitation for what looks like it's going to be a, uh, a great conference. 
Um, and also for the entire uh, organizational team, even from a distance, it is clear how, how uh, well organized uh, and how smoothly the conference organization is growing. Um, I also wanted to thank Matt Luther for, uh, for providing a uh, background to my talk uh, to show in for my lack of technology and also to give your eye somewhere to wander to uh, in the course of what could be typically long-winded talking. Uh, there's also, if my words start to disaggregate, the, the, the different parts of them are hanging over there. <laughs> uh, and thanks to uh, Nirmal Raja, a beautiful installation. Um, so I'm going to talk about animality today. And uh, it sort of spins out and perhaps will spin back into a quote from Bergson, which is, instinct is sympathy. If this sympathy could extend its object and also reflect upon itself, it would give us the key to vital operations. Now, I'm going to uh, work with actually a bit less with Bergson and more with a with, um, philosopher of science and a physician named uh, Raymond Rouyer, R-U-Y-E-R, -E who's not pub published much at all in English yet, but hopefully uh, one of his main books called Neofinalism will be coming out next year with MIT in the next couple of years. Um, Rouyer talks about, uh, uses the word primary consciousness, where Bergson would say intuition, and he says that primary consciousness is one with life, but it's at a level prior to the emergence of discrete objects. So the object that could also, the, the sympathy that could extend its object and also reflect upon itself, there's sort of a prior uh, synthesis of the object that needs to be talked about, which is what most of this talk will be about at that pre-objective level. So that consciousness that is one with life is also follows morphogenesis, or in Lewis and Bakari's terms, becoming. So a lot of this will be playing between the Pouillet and Lewis and Bakari, trying to go back to some of the concepts in A Thousand Plateaus around notions like becoming or animality that are often taken to be quite metaphorical, but I'd like to try to give some kind of, sort of operative, conceptual um, consistency to them. Um, and obviously, if you talk about morphogenesis in relation to the animal you're talking about, at one level or another, evolution, so there's a, uh, an inevitable complication or meeting with uh, neo-Darwinian <coughs> notions of evolution, which are based on external uh, pressures of selection and uh, favor a concept of uh, instinct as the key to selective uh, survival. And the vision of instinct that's often talked about is basically as an autonomism, a reflex, a stereotyped sequence of actions that's automatically triggered uh, by a signal. So it's this kind of mechanistic that stimulates a reflex unfolding of a sequence of stereotyped actions, which uh, is the response. Uh, so that's what uh, I want to start by putting into question and uh, along the way move through the question of instinct to uh, wider questions of play abstraction that probably won't really get, get to that. But where it's moving is uh, in a different direction from theories of evolution that um, concentrate on the moment of sexual selection as the moment in which instinct is, is uh, twisted around or turned and becomes something more creative. And in my account, that will already be happening in play and play will already be happening at the level of Wiyay's primary consciousness. So I wanted to start 
in the beginning, uh, his studies of instinct, with the work of Nico Tinbergen, one of the pioneers of ethology. It was Tinbergen who first noticed that all was not right in the autonomism of instinct. Tinbergen was researching the instinctive behavior of the herring doll. A red spot on the female beak serves as a signal, or in his words, a trigger for feeding behavior. It attracts the peck of the chick. The execution of the peck intensifies the chick's own baking behavior and triggers a corresponding behavior in the adult, namely the regurgitation of the menu. Tinbergen was interested in knowing what precise perceptual quality constituted the trigger. He built decoy gull beaks presenting variable characteristics in an attempt to isolate which characteristics were essential to triggering these instinctive behaviors. His method was guided by four presuppositions. One, that the signal in itself was a discrete stimulus, the color spot. Two, that the stimulus stood out in its discreteness against the supporting background, the form of which was imprinted in the young doll as an innate schema, in other words, the geometry of the adult's beak and head. Three, that the hungry chick's response followed mechanically the appearance of a spot against the background in an actual shape, formally resembling or representing the schema. And four, that the response would be a sequence of purely automatic actions operating as a reflex. The presupposed mechanism was the triggering of an automatism by an instinctive recognition operating according to a principle of formal resemblance. What Tinbergen found, to his own dismay, was quite different. And I say to his own dismay because he never actually integrated it into his thought uh, uh, in a sort of decisive way, but it, it sort of little episodes in his work. And if you, if you, you know, look at the Lisbon Guattari deal with Tinbergen and the Thousand Plateaus, they're very critical precisely because he holds the usual stimulus response model of instinct. So, so I, I, taking these moments where, where, uh, uh, where, where Tin, Tin, Tinbergen was uh, undermining himself to feed it into my, my narrative. Against all expectations, the decoy that most remember, resembled actual seagull beaks and heads exerted the least force of attraction. The most natural or naturalistic forms left something to be desired. Tinbergen decided to push the experiments further by extending the range of variation of the presented form, quote, beyond the limits of the normal object, end quote. The result was decoys that, quoting again, did not look like a very good imitation of a herring doll's beak at all. Certain decoys in which there was a noticeable deficit of resemblance were among the most effective of all. Tinbergen was himself forced to recognize something, that instinct displays an inherent tendency to snub good form and overshoot shoot the limits of the normal in the direction of what he called super, super normal stimuli. The question then became precisely what perceptual qualities press beyond the normal. There's no question that there is a strong correlation between the color red and the triggering feeding behavior. However, the absence of red did not necessarily block the instinctive activity. A spot of another color, even black or gray, could do the job, on the condition that there's high enough contrast between the spot and the background. High contrast red proved the surest signal. But the fact that black or gray could also do the job meant that the effect didn't hinge on a discrete color quality, not even red. What the effectiveness of the presentation hinged on, Tinbergen concluded, was an intensification effect. In this case, it was produced by this relation of contrast. The color red exerted a supernormal force of attraction to the extent that it lent itself to this intensification relation. Gull chicks may have a certain predilection for red, but even with red, there is pressure in the direction of a supernormal forcing red into an intensifying relation of immediate proximity with another color. 
the more contrasted, the better. It was the proximity of differences in quality, this qualitative neighborhood, that dynamized the force of attraction, pushing the instinct to surpass what had been assumed to be its natural target. The term supernormal does not connote a simple opposition between what is normal and what is not, or between natural and artificial. What it connotes is a plasticity of natural limits and a natural disrespect of good form. It indicates a tendency toward deformation, stretching behavior out of shape from within its own instinctive operation, a transformational movement pushing animal experience to artificially exceed its normal bounds. Supernormal stimuli express a natural tendency toward an affirmation of excessiveness. Supernormal dynamism is better than supernormal stimulus because it better reflects its tendential movement and the relational tenor of its trigger. The word trigger should be revisited as well. If the signal functioned purely to trigger an automatic sequence of actions, it would be naturally resistant to the intervention of the supernormal dynamism. It would be firmly under the jurisdiction of the laws of resemblance governing good form and its well-behaved representation. The supernormal dynamism would come in contravention of those laws, relegating it to a status of a simple negative and infraction rather than recognizing it as an affirmation of what exceeds their bounds. It also consigns it to the status of an externality, like an accident whose occurrence doesn't rightfully belong to the situation's nature and simply intrudes. But the supernormal tendency pushes from within as a dimension of the situation. It does not come up against with accidental nonchalance. It pushes across with a distinct air of exaggeration. It doesn't just throw the behavioral functioning off its form, it makes the form of the functioning behaviorally vary. It twists the situation into a new relational variation, experientially intensifying it. What is in play is an imminent experiential excess, by virtue of which the normal situation presents a pronounced tendency to surpass itself. The fact that Tinbergen was unable to predict which characteristics were determining testifies to the fact that what's at stake is not a resemblance to a specific scheme asserting as a model. The triggering so-called stimulus was not, in fact, isolatable and was not subject to the necessity of corresponding to a model. The most that can be said is that red as stimulus is bound to contrast. The same applies to other qualities ingredients of the situation. If they are likewise treated as linked or indissolubly, indissolubly bound variables, in other words, as relata, the bounds of potential variation are stretched. The plasticity of the situation is complicated with additional dimensions. The unpredictability grows with the complexity. For example, the geometric variables of length and thickness of beak and beak size in comparison to head size enter into relation with contrast yielding a color-linked geometry in motion. The rhythm and pattern of the movement express, co uh, uh, express a collective co-variation, shaken into further variation by the changes in aspect accompanying the quasi-chaotic movements of the hungry chick. The sum total of the qualities ingredient to the variation do not add up to a gestalt. There is no reliable background any more than there is a fixed figure to stand out against it. When one quality changes, its proximity to others in the directness of interlinkage entails a simultaneous variation affecting them all in something like a relativist curvature of the space-time of behavior. Any variation reverberates across them all with a contagious space force of deformation. As Tinbergen observes, such relational or configurational stimuli seem to be the rule rather than the exception." End quote. There is no privileged element capable of extracting itself from the immediate neighborhood with the, from the immediate neighborhood with the totality of linked qualities. The color red may well be a favorite of the gulls, but its preeminence can even be endangered by Nazi gray. An element that is normally foregrounded is perpetually at risk of sinking back into the vulgarity of the movement of the moving ground from which it distinguished itself. Any distinct quality may be swallowed back up at any time in the tide of collective variation. 
Given this general condition of covariant linkage between qualities in the immediate experiential neighborhood, it is no wonder that the ethologist was rarely able to predict the response to models, including a supernormal element. Even after the fact, it was impossible to identify with certainty which linkage the relational intensification was due to. So far, Tinbergen writes, no one has been able to quite analyze such matters, yet somehow, they are accomplished. And I think that's the last word on this topic in his work. <laughs> At most, it is possible to discern passages toward plastic limits with periods of relative stasis along the way, vectors of supernormality punctuated by states and by stases in the unfolding of the instinct's internal dynamic. In Deleuze and Guattarian terms, it is more a question of consistency, that is to say, perceptual self-consistency, then it is a question of gestalt or perceptual form in any normal sense. Philosopher of science, Raymond Bouillet, uses the word autoconduction, self-conducting, which again has the advantage of connoting the dynamism. The upshot is that there is an inexpungible element of unpredictability and in instinct. It pertains not to the outside intervention of accidents, but rather to the self-consistency of its experiential dynamic. Huyin makes much of the fact that the instinct may trigger in the absence of any stimulus, because this demonstrates a capacity for spontaneity. Huyin holds that this capacity for spontaneity, which he qualifies as hallucinatory, must be considered a necessary dimension of all instinct. Although the spontaneity of instinct cannot be reduced to the accidental accidents, nevertheless play a role. According to Guy, we must consider that an animal in a complex, accident-rich environment would have little chance of survival if it could only avail itself of stereotype movements, even if they were corrected by orienting stimuli. Of far greater importance are responses that are improvised directly upon the stimulus, improvised directly, acting as a kind of irritant rather than as a signal. Input. The lesson of the accident is, if instinct really lived up to its repetition as a reflex mechanism, it would be downright maladaptive. For this reason, Bouillet replaces the notion of trigger and signal, and that of purely external accident, in one terminological stroke, induced improvisation. The stimulus irritates, provokes, stirs. It is a processual inducer. What it induces most directly is an integral modification in the tendential self-consistency of animal experience correlated to the externality of an accident-rich environment, but governed by its own stirring logic of qualitative variation. Observable behavior change in an environment is the external face of this imminent modification. In itself, the modification is hallucinatory in the sense that it is improvised directly on perceived quality, operating unmediatedly in the experiential domain of qualitative neighborhood. The physical environment and the qualitative neighborhood are in close processual embrace, but their dynamics remain distinct. Their difference in nature is never erased. The environment or external milieu does in the end impose selective constraints. Its selective principle is and remains that of adaptation. And yet, instinct opposes to the law of adaptation an auto-conducting power of improvisation that answers to external necessity with a supernormal twist. The improvised modification of the instinctive tendency, although externally induced, takes its own spontaneous form. As an improvisation, it is formally self-causing. Evolution is and remains subject to selective pressure, but that is not the question. Tinbergen's research raises the question that Tinbergen's research raises for ethology and by extension for the philosophy of science. Conceptually, the question pertains to relation. Adaptation concerns external relations between an animal and its environment. Selective pressure exerts an external judgment on the fitness of the modification. By contrast, what an improvisation concerns directly in the tendential neighborhood of its own activity are internal relations, co-varying experiential qualities that come with a block 
indissociably interlinked. For Deleuze and Guattari, as for Ouyé and Bergson, there's another dynamic generic variation besides the accident, including the accident of genetic mutation, which needs to be dealt with by one piece here. There is a positive principle of form-generating selection operating in its own neighborhood autonomously of selective adaptation to external conditions. The peck of the herringbone expresses an inventive power of artifice imminent to the nature of instinct, no less than instinct is imminent to nature. To the adaptive imperative of conformity to the demands of selective pressure, instinct opposes an imminent power of supernormal invention. Faced with a change in the environment, like a sudden appearance of a red spot, of a red spot sporting beak on the head, it turns tail, folding back on itself to return to its own neighborhood, there to renew with its native tendency. The environment preys upon the instinctive animal. In answer, animal instinct plays upon the environment. In much the sense, a musician plays improvisational variations on a theme. Bergson made the point, instinct, he said, is played more than it is represented. Right? And uh, the English uh, of creative evolution is translated as active, uh, which works because it's, if you put both senses of it being an act and being acted out, or either being like an acting uh, in the sense of play, playing a role. The ludic element of instinct cries out from the margin of play and the interaction between individuals and between the organism and the environment. The blind necessity of mechanistic adaptation, selecting schema of automatism, is just half the story. Instinctual behavior is ringed, in Bouillet's words again, by a fortuitous fringe of induced improvisation. The list of Atari referred to creative involution saying that it occurs, occurs on such a fringe, a phrase itself, playing on Bergson's creative evolution. Involution, according to his inquiry. To involve is to form a block that runs its line between the terms in the play and beneath assignable relations, which is to say, external relations. Both individual, between individuals and between the organism and the milieu runs a tendential line in the direction of the supernormal. It plays directly in the unassignable register of internal relations, immediate qualitative linkages, in a solidarity of variation, mutually deforming as a plastic block. The tracing of this line of plasticity is unpredictable, but is not, strictly speaking, accidental or aleatory, being oriented for the spontaneous excess of creative self-consistency. The tendency toward the supernormal is a vector. It is not only oriented, it carries a force. For example, a cuckoo chick possesses supernormal traits, encouraging the female of another species whose nest the cuckoo parasitizes it to feed it. Parasit parasitizes to feed it. The host female, Tinbergen said, isn't willing to feed the invader. No, she positively loves to do it. She does not do it grudgingly but positively with passion. The force of the supernormal is a positive force. It's not the mechanistic kind that pushes up against the resistance to deliver an impulse to terminate commensurate movement in reactive conformity with the applied force. What we have with the supernormal is a kind of force that pulls forward from ahead an attractive force. Supernormality is an attractor that draws behavior in its direction, following its own tendency, behavior's own tendency, not in conformity, but deformity, and surpassing normality without common measure. Supernormality is a force not of impulsion or compulsion, but of affective propulsion. This is why it's so necessary to say that instinct involves the inducement of an effect rather than the triggering of an automatism. The list of Tari had a favorite word for affective force that pulls deformationally, creatively ahead outside common measure. Desire. Desire is the other imminent principle of selection. Elizabeth Hardy defined desire as a force of liaison, a force of interlinkage with a transformational tendency. Desire has no particular object. It's a vector. This object is before it all is to come. Desire vectorizes being for the emergence of the new. Desire is one with the autoconducting movement of becoming. Becoming bears on linked experiential qualities 
you know, solidarity, mutual modification, or what Deleuze and Guattari call blocks of sensation. It plays upon unpredictable relational effects. It is the improvisation of these deformational relational effects that constitutes the new. As Deleuze writes, form is no longer separable from a transformation or transfiguration that establishes a kind of linkage animated by life of its own. That's from the uh, Francis Bacon book, Logic of Sensation. That last line, which kind of linkage animated by life of its own, is translated as a, um, a romantic affair with the decent life, or something like that, which makes sense in, uh, in French, but uh, I think it's a good uh, context. Creative life of instinct, vital art. Wye remarks that it is of the nature of instinctive activity to produce what he calls an aesthetic yield. After all, what is a force of mutual linkage if not a force of composition? The Lizzie Vittari asks, can this be coming? This emergence, this composition animating, these are my words, the genesis of new forms of the life of their own and producing an aesthetic yield, can this be called art? Now we've entered another immediate neighborhood, that of art, the animal, and becoming. That is to say, evolution played upon by creative involution. In this immediate proximity to Lizzie Vittari right, what is animal or human in us is indistinct. End quote. For if we can call this art, it is because the human has the same, the same self-animating tendency to supernormality. Only when we experience it in our own bizarre lives, we arrogantly tend to call it culture as opposed to nature, as if the animal body of human beings was somehow exempt from instinctive activity. As any biologist would tell you, the human body is on the animal continuum. Instinctively, as Lewis and Katari might say, we humans are in a zone of indiscernibility with the animal. Paradoxically, when we return most intently and intensely to that neighborhood, they say, we gain singularly in distinction. It is when a human assumes its imminent excess of animality that it becomes all the more itself. Brilliantly so, quote, the maximum determination issues from this block of neighborhood like a flash, unquote. One might ask, if instinct is animated by a tendential block of its hallucinatory nature, if its object is a bundle of internal relations, the involutionary experience of which is purely qualitative, if its activity consists in aesthetic improvisation, how can it effectively contribute to morphogenesis, the evolution of forms of life? How can a maximum determination effectively issue from a vague, somehow, Tinbergen somehow, of an unpredictable spontaneity of continuous vari variation, as Tinbergen also noted, no one has been able to analyze. Surely, we must be speaking in metaphors. On the contrary, the Lizzie Vittari means no words. Becoming requires, quote, the abolition of metaphor. Creative involution, they insist, is fully real. It is really, literally, an engine of the genesis of the forms of life. In order to understand how the blocks of perceptual qualities that play improvisationally play an active role in becoming, it is necessary to take a closer look at their form it was established that they are not discrete figures standing out against the supporting background. They are not determined forms or gestalt configurations. The concept most adequate to understand the form is Bergson's notion of qualitative multiplicities. Bergson conceived qualitative multiplicities on the mode of melody. Music also plays a surprisingly central role in the lesson of Atari's theories of animality. A note in a musical phrase is not perceived in its particularity. It would not be a musical note, as opposed to a sound, plain and simple, if it did not envelop a musicality integral to its direct perception. A note of music is not discreetly perceived against the background of silence in a simple succession of notes. It is at one and the same time that it is perceived in the succession, and that its belonging to the succession is perceived in it. The musicality of the series infuses each successive point. The entire series an individual note or in a relation of mutual inclusion in a neighborhood of immediate processual proximity. The note gathers into itself the cumulative effect of all the preceding notes at the same time as the series takes up the note into its 
subsequent unfolding, the notes in gathering of his precursors is heard as a momentum, an élan, or imminent impulse. The felt presence, inseparable from the note itself, of a preceding movement now moving through, heading to an eventual end. This movement is felt as an impersonal intention that the, that of the musical phrase itself to reach a terminus. The movement sounds across the notes as a tendency toward self-completion, determinately, if not yet determinately, with a determination to be determined. On first listening, the exact nature of the end toward which the phrase is heading is not known, and yet its finality is already cutting itself, vaguely but insistently. The coming to an end is felt in the current indetermination of a musical force in the process of accomplishing itself, attracted by its own terminus. But at each note along the way, the precise nature of the terminus is still not in question. A plurality of alternative developments is felt in the open-endedness. The musical phrase takes the note up into the oriented tension of its determination to determine itself. The complementary inclusion of the unfolding series in the note is the mutual inclusion at that point of a multiplicity of potential unfoldings forcefully felt in the suspense of the presently endless momentum. The note's fullness of this intense multiplicity of co-potential termini is all the more pressing when the music is improvised. In improvisation, the end is not only to be reached, it is to be made, flushed with the flow of the very movement of its making. The note itself carries a multiplicity proper to itself, proper to it. The same note can be played on different instruments. Even played on the same instrument, the musical quality differs each time. The note is the note it is, and it's differing into a population of potential variants on itself. This potential difference is also felt in a less pressing way, without tension, in the vague feeling of presently included, excluded <coughs> variants. The note that actually sounds is doubled by a multiplicity of notes that go unheard, but are not merely absent, notes that are presently virtual and are felt as such, accompanying this actual note in silent echo. Each moment in the unfolding of a musical series is at the intersection of two virtual multiplicities. One is a tense multiplicity of co-potential line-like variations, <coughs> unfoldings toward alternate endings. The other is the comparative rela comparatively relaxed multiplicity of punctual variants, individual notes slightly <coughs> echoing with a self-differing sameness. The musical phrase actually underway resonates with these unactualized qualitative multiplicities, punctual and linear. A system of points conjugated with a system of lines describes a plane. This is Deleuze and Guattari's plane of consistency. The plane of consistency is formed by the mutual inclusion of the two kinds of multiplicity, variant and variational. From the perspective of the plane of consistency, the musical phrase is composed of purely internal relations in the sense that they're imminent to the complex movement tracing the plane. These imminent relations are of two kinds, corresponding to two kinds of multiplicities. The linear variations constitute a multiplicity of themes corresponding to divergent tendency. The term theme comes from Guillet and was taken up by the wisdom of time. Each variant represents the singularity of a self-populated pumpkin. Divergent themes are different one from the other. The singularity of the pumpkin is differential, multiple in relation to itself. The systematic coupling of the divergences and differentials variants and variations, punctums and themes, resonates in the eventful particularity of each actually performed note. In the following note, it re-resonates, differently again to new effect. The plane of consistency effectively goes a differing in step with themes becoming what it really would have been as it reaches its terminus. The progressive determination of the phrase is doubled by a vague feeling of the compositional whole of a virtual plane imminently traced of taste phrases unfolding. The production of the current of novelty and the determination of a terminal identity are two distinct aspects of the same tendential movement in reciprocal presupposition in the closest of processual embraces. The more highly improvised the movement, the more tightly the two aspects embrace each other in the emergent novelty of a terminal identity in the making. What does a note do when it sounds? 
It cuts in with advancing determination. It decides for the moment which themes will be left in silence and which will continue to resonate in the current of determination. Its sounding selects a momentary musical effect from among the population of co-potential variants in the same stroke orienting thematic variation. The momentary, this momentary determination is eliminated, excluding from actualization all notes but one. But its sounding singularity does not reduce the multiplicity in play to one. There remain unheard notes proposing themselves for the next cut, each corresponding to a further orientation of the musical unfolding. At each step, the number of potential themes is reduced, not to one, but to a more constrained multiplicity. What the sounding of the note does is divide the plane of consistency. The division progresses, note by note, until the final note sounds and the musical piece reaches its terminus, achieving complete determination by a gradual process of eliminated division. No further notes forthcoming, only one theme is left, the one and only that will actually become this theme remains as what Wye calls a mnemic trace, a memory trace. But if this theme remains as a mnemic trace, must not all the prior themes that became before also mnemically remain? And what of the co-potential vari variants that were vaguely felt but did not sound? And what of the co-potential, do they not continue to echo? And the variations that press for actualization but did not achieve it? At the terminus, when all is done and sounded, the full multiplicity of the of consistency, the pressing crowd of themes and singularities, silently reaffirms itself. It comes back into play, the fullness of musical potential restored for next selected becoming, not only restored, but augmented, for the theme just become adds itself to a crowd. The fully augmented plane of consistency exerts a quiet force of thematic attraction for musical events to come. In Deleuze and Guattari's vocabulary, the sounding of the note is a component of passage, advancing the movement with improvisational determination of becoming. The selected action of the component of passage bears on musical qualities. It is nevertheless not without quantitative import. The notes cutting selectively into the multiplicity of themes and singularities reduces the bandwidth of potential for the next step of the unfolding. The phrase's potential content is now less ample than it was a moment ago. This less is quasi-quantitative. It has to do with the visibility, which is a char characteristic of number, but it is not denumerable because the unfolding continues to envelop a vague infinity of virtualities which is only reduced relative to a certain actual end. What the note does is to ex extract from this indistinct solidarity of linked variants and variations resonant with uncountable infinities of unassignable internal relations, a quantum of quality. That quantum of quality remains entirely bound up with the multiplicity it reduces and is inseparable from the movement of the musical progression across the singularity of its momentary sounding. It is the progressive accumulation of successive quantum of quality that produces number. The piece of music at its terminus counts as one. This one, remembered as one among others, adds its number to the historical population of music to become. The many, as Whitehead says, become one and are increased by one. The multiple becoming singular comes to count as one, adding creatively to the world's multiplicity. The completed musical piece now counts, in both senses of the word, becoming innumerable and playing a place in the world. The quantum of quality understood as part of this process, emergent determination is what the Liz and Guattari call a particle <coughs> of becoming. So, uh, I just wanted to, I didn't get as far as I thought I wanted to make, make some other uh, comments, uh, just to show you how, how it eventually wins that uh, uh, beginning, uh, beginning quote. But what I was trying to do was show that there is a surely qualitative experiential logic that has to, that accompanies every step of the way the selective, adaptive logic of external constraints placed upon a life by an external uh, milieu. So that you're always looking, neither of those existence in themselves because the, the, the principle of movement and the creation of form comes from 
the qualitative side of claim consistency, whereas the other side, where things start to number, count as one, become measurable, or spatialized in Bergson's term, is what goes into what I call a plane of organization. And on that plane, what's in play are functions and utilities rather than passions and deformations, improvised inventions. So you have to find ways of talking about both of those two things at the same time, which is what that concept of the component of passage does, because it's at the same time that an act, a gesture, a vital gesture, indexes an invention on a plane of deformation, and then a deformation on a plane of consistency, and marks a place in a territory. So you have, you have both the non-local liaisons and the linkages uh, of the virtual multiplicity that's in play, and the becoming permanently one as part of configuration of functions alongside other discrete elements. Um, the main point for me is that in that, that sort of one of the, that, that means that even as this is a philosophy of individuation coming of the one of the individual, it has to do can only be thought in terms of trans-individuality, because on the plane of consistency in those virtual multiplicities, there is there are an infinity of variants and variations, and that direct intuitive acting out gesturally of the potential that is found there is a, a way of apprehending that multiplicity of variants and variations. So in an instinctive act, which by then is becoming an artistic act, the, uh, the living thing, the being the animal, is indexing itself to a trans-individual flow of becoming. Now, the, uh, that means, I mean, you think about it in a lot of ways. Uh, a lot of school thinks about it in terms of point counterpoint. He talks about uh, spiders' webs in the way that the spider web virtually includes the potential of a fly in its form. So it's a kind of vital gesture <coughs> that is, is taking into account, apprehending in its actual construction, this trans-individuality of relations between different things that can be transposed from different points of environment or from environment to environment. So trans-individuality becomes a very key term, and that's where instinct comes back to sympathy. Because the animal does not have sympathy for the other. Reed says the animal is sympathy. That, that direct intuitive apprehension of trans-individuality becoming as acted out in a vital gesture is an, a thinking in act, a thinking, a thinking in germ of everything I was just describing, so that it qualifies as a form of consciousness or apprehension but it's not of an external, it's just, it's just too complicated. There are too many levels at which there are, it's not externality to, to, to um, construe it in normal perceptual terms as the uh, perception of an outside object. Uh, so, um, so Lee says that animal activity is instinctive activity, that that instinctive activity goes Throughout the animal continuum, he talks about the inventive abilities of amoeba in ways that recall Jane Bennett's uh, discussion of uh, Darwin's inventive improvisational worms in Vibrant Matter. Uh, and uh, he says that, so that, that, that intuition and sympathy are really of the warp and woof of the animal, and that this continuum, which includes the human, in fact, the most becoming of what there is in the human is a return and reappropriation, reapprehension of the animality of the human, but that the continuum can't, according to VA, be limited to that because wherever there's an attractive force, think attractors in physics, wherever there are unfoldings where phases gather themselves up and anticipate further phasings, there is something of this plane of consistency. So we would say that you have to ex have to expand this continuum in different degrees of primary of this primary consciousness, intuition, and sympathy to the very depths of matter itself. Thank
have any other clock to look at? We have 15 minutes, right? 30 minutes. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I was being late. Okay. So I'll take questions. Then. Yes. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, and the, I think the two, there's a tension in this relationality that you're describing through sympathy, where sympathy is a kind of relation where, for example, the spider's web is in relationship with the fly in some way. But at the same time, you are also saying that the same stimulant can lead to different responses, very creative responses in the organism. Yeah. So how to resolve this? So in some ways, the responses are, are are imminent in the sense that one cannot know the language of the outside. Because, and, and the language has to be recreated or recursively recreated internally, internally developed uh, power. Yes. So how the two then connect the, the non-relationality as well as relationality together? Yeah, well, I, I try to connect it through this uh, idea of a vital gesture as a component of passage that's at the intersection of the two. Like what I, what I said, that it's, it's marking a place, a position in, in, uh, in a spatial domain, whereas Rie calls the virtual domain of, of, of themes, of variations, transpatials. And this whole work is a theory of a transpatial. Um, so it's, it's marking a position in a spatial domain where what counts are functional relations, which are external relations between working parts, which takes the parts into relation as already formed elements. Whereas on the other hand, we have this deformational plasticity where everything is in bound, everything is, all variables are bounded together uh, in this un, unassignable block. And so in some sense, it's ideal, um, but, it, but it inhabits every act. Um, so that leads to sort of theories of, uh, Territorialization, territorialization of function, uh, but again, the, the the other logic always follows and is always reseeding every territory with the potential for 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 new uh, sort of inventive responses that have the potential to be selected to become new functions that are added into the organization of the world, and then that locks separate beings into external relations of prey, predator, male, female, in, uh, in mating behaviors, etc. Um, so the other, one of the other steps uh, that uh, I think needs to be developed is um, the uh, theory of animal play, in, in properly, in, in, the, in, in the proper sense of play, uh, which is always, uh, I think the, the best thing I've read on animal play is Bateson's uh, essay on uh, play and fantasy. Uh, and uh, he makes it really clear that you have to think of play in terms of territory, because the security of a territory gives the margin of freedom to improvisational play, where a young animal, for example, isn't going to be eaten immediately because it's playing, rather than worrying about the predator. Uh, so territoriality and play get, get, put, get put together. But it's through play that this whole process feeds, feeds forward evolutionarily. So Bateson talks about how play is setting in place this frame where there are functions. Every function has a meaning in the sense of what it, what it provides. Uh, there, there is an inside and outside because there's a boundary beyond which it becomes dangerous. You know, it, it could be spatial, it could be spatial temporal. But, but it's, it's a bounded space. But just what play does is observe that, take advantage of it, and suspend it. Because what the animal is saying when it's playing, when it bites another animal and it doesn't want to be bitten back and sustain an injury that could kill it, it changes stylistically. It improvises on functions, animal functions that have arisen through these and through the sexual process they're talking about. It improvises on, on a way that's sort of commenting on its own activity. It's saying, Bateson says, I'm biting you, but this is not a bite. I'm denoting biting, but I'm not biting you. So that holding together of the biting and not biting as denotation creates, a, creates an autonomy of meaning in itself separate from any kind of direct uh, dependency on function. So that take, takes uh, the other side of this organization space and functions, 
it creates another, another field of play uh, that is a field of abstraction, of meaning, in the animal that he says we have to talk about as the, as the motor of evolution in the most literal sense, and as the setting in place of what in, in the human animal will become language. So the, the, everything I've talked about is, is, a, is sort of a continuing line of abstraction leading toward language, which means that you have to then talk about language oddly, which most people don't want to do it, in terms of instinct, in terms of animality. And that's what Buddhism and Bhattari do when they talk about, for example, in the Kafka book, of uh, becoming animal in terms of a writing process. So then you can twist that all around and develop that again in the activity the writing, it becomes basically an open-ended series of abstractions that are all playing on that ideality of the transdictional domain. You spoke of the multiplicity of variants and trans-individuality and how that was driven, in a sense, by the attractors, and that implies um, a kind of a <coughs> space. And I know uh, Ramon Deland has done some work in this area, Jan James Ladyman has. Um, I was just wondering, have you thought much about that? And if so, how do these phase spaces uh, arise, evolve, dissipate? Yeah, uh, I think I, I like the, the notion of phase space. I used to quite a bit in my, my, one of the first books, you just um, And I think it's, I think it's really you know, sort of a point at which uh, science uh, in the forms of chaos and complexity theory, uh, starts to to approach uh, what is at stake philosophically and what I'm doing here. But at the same time, if phase space is only talk, is only talked about in act in energetic terms, which it often is, uh, without being extended into the question of the uh, under what form the phases are co-present without energetically expressing themselves, then the philosophical movement is cut short, which is fine for science, because fine science precisely doesn't want to be philosophy. Um, and, but what that does is cut off the continuing into metaphysical understanding, and I think there has to be a sort of confrontation with with ideality, which is why I wanted to go back to Wiyé talking about primary consciousness uh, in terms, in these instinctual terms. So, um, so yes, yeah, space, space, space makes a lot of sense to me. It's a similar question in, in the work of Simon Don, where he talks about the associated milieu, and he talks about it as a system of energy transfer between a self-organizing entity and the environment, which is a product of its own self-organizing, it's in a lot of ways it's close to theories, a lot of pieces. But he says that the associated milieu, it's not the outside milieu that the exchange of energy is with. It's not the energy itself, but it's the patterning or the system or rhythm of energy transfer. And that itself is non-local, it's not any particular exercise or operation. Uh, and and it has a certain, what he calls a solidarity, or what in Guitari's terms would be consistency. It has a consistency that means that if you see it once, that doesn't exhaust the thing. That same associated milieu, in that multiplicitous sense of saying that it's developing the paper, will come up somewhere else, or can come up somewhere else. So that it has that, hold that multiplicity, and I don't see any way, other way of holding that extent of multiplicity the extent necessary to account for the potential that must be in the world for becoming to occur, for new forms to be generated without integrating what um, a lot of people for a long time, including myself, tend to push away as metaphysical. Uh, yeah. uh, first, I Um, as an interpretive tool. Um, and the question is, 
Do you think it might be the case that the beak uh, replica that least resembles the beak that it's based on uh, might be a more effective metaphor for the original beak than the ones that look more like it? Uh, in the sense that there's some you know, possible like je ne sais quoi to the, to the supernormal example that has some kind of resemblance there, the ontological speaking that the other ones don't. Maybe because the other ones are so close to the original, they're kind of identifiable <coughs> yeah. as replicas. And that, that possibility is to the sense that there might be some sort of form coming to bear on this that's just not given any single one of the qualities. I mean, in the abstract, that's, I think that's a perfectly uh, uh, plausible hypothesis. In practice, I find it very hard to understand how to work. Because if you think of evolutionary series, they're basically a series of topological transformations. And topological transformation is very, very difficult to assign a, where the transition takes place. You, you freeze in the transition, but the next point is also a transition. It's hard to tell where one form ends, one form begins. The topological figure is the entire system of self-consisting variations, meaning that you can't, you can't, if you cut it, it becomes something else and it's uncut. So uh, if you think of evolutionary series, you know, where, where would you go to find that form? Except in a, in a domain of ideology in a very, very different sense than what I'm talking about, which is one that is never in that kind of close and processual embrace that I'm talking about, when I talk about actual and virtual, you have to talk about them together. You have to talk about how they come absolutely together in an act, in events. Uh, if you take the other hypothesis, you're extracting it from the act in the events, and you're putting the form in some other realm, and you're having an idealism, you're, you get up with idealism in a more traditional sense, rather than as an animal theory of ideality. Um, so th that hypothesis doesn't tempt me or convince me for that reason and for the reason that it gives form in advance. The whole question for the thinkers that I'm interested in is how form emerges, the genesis of form. Um, and in Simon Bell's work, there is something that he calls the absolute origin. Um, but it's not in another plane in a pre-given form or model, it's in the sort of thicking into operational solidarity of this whole system of phases, phasings in, phasings out, including at another level of virtuality all of the potential variations on that. And but that happens as an act. It happens between elements when a relation takes on a, a consistency of solidarity, an operative consistency. So I'm interested in operational theories, you know, theories that really take the, take the operation as, uh, uh, as more basic than function in the sense. Uh, and really, really try to work with the genesis of form without presupposing form. So the other, the other thing about metaphor is that it's hard for me, you know, it's hard for me to think of it without without implicitly reinstating a subject separate from the situation. Because here, Bouillet calls his auto-conducting a self-proprioception or a self-possession. So the pairing goal is taking possession of its own potential in the act. And in that improvisation, it's, taking, it's making its own all that it could be. But in the process, it becomes one, one thing that falls into that particularity. Um, so that kind of self-possession uh, raises the question, you know, like who's having what? The girl's not having intuition. The girl's being had by animal intuition. It's passing through it. It's becoming it from within that movement. Uh, and that, for, that, that's the way that I can keep thinking emergence in a strong sense. Whereas if, if, you think of, if you think that there's an original performance and model, then uh, it emerges in a very different sense. And, that, and it seems to me that there's a positing of a subject that's just not too embarrassing to talk about. 
um, because something is making this metaphorical connection with, from outside the situation. Uh, Brian, I'm curious that you didn't use the term absolute survey, you know, which is a term that I would think that one would point to initially to talk about the losing guitar is borrowing from the and, yeah. and you know, in some ways you're, that's all you can talk about. That's all I can talk about. But I guess I'm just curious why you don't use the term. It's one of the other pages. Yeah, absence survey when the French is sauvage, which it means uh, literally kind of overflow, uh, because it sort of, so it keeps that connotation of, of dynamism in it. And, and the idea, it's, 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 you're right, it's, it's everything I'm talking about that is the primary consciousness, that is that self-possessing, that is the, the in, intuition, that's a, not an apprehension of an object, but a prehension of a process. Uh, all of that, uh, if you want to construe it in terms of consciousness or proto-consciousness, you, you need, you need a, a concept like, self, like, like absolute survey, or, or sometimes I like to say just self-survey, uh, just to, to, try to try to get that paradox of a total proximity, an absolute proximity or neighborhood of things that are in other aspects or in other dimensions separate. Bia uses a lot the example of the checkerboard. He says, you don't, you don't see each square. You don't need to see the set of all the squares. You see the pattern which is between and across the squares directly as if you had some outside perspective, but you don't because that is your perception and you are your perception and you're in it. And that's what he called this kind of absolute survey. It's a relational, directly relational perception. Yeah, so yesterday uh, I woke up and found at our work theory four ghosts, uh, Rosewick and Rosewick, who uh, had appeared last year on May 6th, this year on uh, May 2nd. And at, at the theater at about at roughly the same time, we learned from our neighbors that they've been coming on a regular basis, coming through. I, as many birders or you know, feeders, have had the same kind of experience, I think. When we lived in Atlanta, we had a hermit thrush that seemed to come through at about the same time every year. So one way that one thinks about that is how do they know, like, to find this feeder, you know, every, every time? And, 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 and to vary it with the, ch vary it with the change in the climate as well, which is happening more and more. Right, exactly, exactly. So the, but as we've been talking, I was thinking that maybe the wrong way to think about it is how do these birds know to find this feeder? But to think about migration as happening through the birds in the same way you were talking exactly, about. Exactly, yeah. It's a very, right. And so that what's, hap what's occurring is not this some kind of individual perception, but actually some much more sort of complex uh, process that involves probably sunlight, wind, weather, um, terrain, and other kinds of things as well. So is this something that uh, yeah, no, that's exactly you guys talk about? Oh, well, I don't know if they talk about it, but I think it would fit perfectly into this, into this way of looking at it, because there is that, that multiplicity, principle infinite, a variable that somehow gets fused into an action and is somehow apprehended or prehended in that kind of absolute survey because they're not the bird can't be where where all those variables are, right? Actually, and it doesn't have a reflexive consciousness. That's a kind of according to we a second order emergence, which I would again put to connect to play in that kind of set, uh, kind of next level abstraction that comes with play, it doesn't have that. But somehow there is that prehension, not only of those elements in play, but of trauma. The, the, the bird feed is exactly what you're talking about. And further, I'm thinking about the kind of music that you're laying out. The end of the migration, in a sense, exists virtually throughout exactly. the yeah. flights and the various stops along the way. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. That's right, because the terminus, yeah, the terminus is, is constitutively vague. It's an orientation, but a lot can happen because it has to be a processional unfolding and it can be it, it can be modulated or tweaked on route. And it can fail. Uh, if that's if that's all, well, uh, is there, is there any other questions? I mean, we don't even have time for a break. I can see someone's head almost going up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yes, because um, I mentioned the word gesture, or idle gesture, a couple of times. So, so an act is a gesture to the extent that it's bringing to expression this uh, process of, of life, living itself, potentially living, inventively. Um, so that's already, that's, that, that gesture in itself is a kind of abstraction. And the kinds of linked solidarities that I was talking about of the perceptual qualities that underlie the improvisation are cut across uh, modalities of perception. Because what because there, there are potential sites, but every potential site after movement or from another perspective is a potential touch, etc. So there's there, there's a kind of intersensorial and synesthetic uh, uh, dimension to that that I was talking about. When I was talking about play as another level of abstraction, and language is yet another, it's not that it's leaving all of that, it's bringing it with it. And just as when, when an animal goes from one act to the next, in the hiatus between acts, there's that restoration of the fullness of potential I talked about in terms of the, the musical potential that is resurgent at the end of a theme where all of the music's in history and more can then be played and are in some sense virtually there. Um, so all of that is, so the language indexes all those prior levels just as that first level primary consciousness indexes the playing consistency. So that just as you can't separate out the external view of this plane of organization and the plane of consistency as primary consciousness, you can't separate that language from play, uh, from tech, uh, from vital gesture. And it, it can move, move all of those move with it, and it can move us back into them. Um, so, so you have to, again, have to think uh, even more complexly with all of those levels rather than one as opposed to the other. So that makes language as a kind of incredibly powerful technology of virtuality. Now we've made a switch to humans. Could you uh, <laughs> say something about psychoanalysis? I, in in um, um, Parables of the Virtual, you talk about the non-conscious to yeah. show your departure from Freud. Um, but um, I, I was just wondering in, in your work on instincts now, how you, um, uh, do you, do you have a critical note to pose to psychoanalysis? And if so, how do you fold in the death drive if you do? Because of course, play is not, is not the only expression of instinct. That there is, um, that, that you agree with, with, with Freud on the death drive or not, there is, um, in Deleuze and Qatari, very clear sort of sense that, uh, that violence is self-destruction uh, as well in, in um, in life, so so yeah, yeah. So how do you? Um, well, I um, I don't know if I have anything really new to add to it. Um, what I'm calling here is sort of the proto the primary consciousness or this direct prehension is the non-conscious. You know, I was talking about in the travels of virtual because it's the non-reflective consciousness, and I'm concerned with trying to reintegrate reflective consciousness and operate with the distinction between modes. Uh, of consciousness that can be stringed out in a continuum going you know, down to the or, or beyond to into the inorganic 
as well as to, to the, up to the human. Uh, so, so I'm still very concerned with the non-conscious. Uh, that fortuitous fringe of variation that VA talks about fringes off in all directions to less and less present or less and less echoing variations to, uh, into non-consciousness. But non-consciousness is, is, is a fringe rather than a core. Um, also, when I was talking about this tendency, you could, and, and how it's hallucinatory, it doesn't have an object, you tie that to the drive in certain psychoanalytic theories, in particular, sort of later Lacan, which is the theory of uh, the object of the TI and the kinds of circuits of tendential uh, moving out and return around that object which is absent. You could move in that direction from there, but the emphasis on absence uh, uh, doesn't please me because I uh, really trying to describe as a plenum of nature and a plenum of experience as, as uh, much, much more fundamental. Uh, and then the other uh, question in relation to that drive, I don't think I have any any answer other than the one that was in the car you gave at the Epicus where when I was talking about that moment of resurgence where all the virtuality comes back at once and it's this totally, it's, it, it has to be non-conscious, it just doesn't fit in any form of consciousness, this fullness of virtuality that comes back in intervals uh, and, and, and the, the troughs between pulses and process. Uh, they call that in Antiochus the body without organs, which is basically another word for the kind of consistency, but they say that is the death drive because it can't be lived. It's completely unlivable. It's not because of absence, because, but because it's way too full of potential. And it, it, it's like a black hole of potential that would tear any body apart that went into it. Um, so, but that, is, that gives a kind of basis in the theory, for the theory of the death drive in terms of uh, plenums of potentiality rather than fundamentally in terms of absence. And then you have to uh, sort of re-derive and specify what level absence takes on uh, essential consistency. And, and then at that level, the psychoanalytic concepts would come back into force, but they would be relativized in a way that Newtonian physics is relativized in relation to Einstein. Okay, thanks a lot.